بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So our speaker today is Dr. Asad Tarzi. He is a uh, um, he has been designing Islamic educational programs and teaching the basics of Islam for more than a decade. After completing his bachelor's degree in Islamic studies at the University of Michigan, he continued his study of Islamic theology, sacred law, philosophy, and spirituality with some of the country's most prominent Muslim scholars. He has served as the curriculum director for the Dean Intensive Foundation for the last 10 years, and has a particular interest in creating sustainable models of education for new and returning Muslims. He lectures and teaches courses on Islam around the country, for one reason we're quite happy he's here with us today. In 2015, he released his first published work, Being Muslim, A Practical Guide, a primer on practicing the faith. In addition to all of that, he's also an emergency physician by training and lives here in California with a wife and three children. So please um, join with me in introducing uh, Dr. Asad Tarzi. <laughs> Everybody hear me okay? My connection is okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm uh, honored to be with you all this morning. Uh, I will start with the traditional Muslim greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be upon all of you. Uh, I am the first speaker in what I understand is a four part series. Um, so I'm going to hope to sort of lay a bit of a bird's eye view of the religion um, with some of the other speakers, maybe dialing down a bit more to go into detail on some of the specific topics. So uh, a brief outline of what we'll cover today. I would like to um, cover the basic beliefs and practices of Islam. I'll talk a little bit about Islamic view of spirituality. Um, and then unfortunately, nowadays, you can't talk just about what Islam is. You have to clarify what Islam isn't. So we'll get into a few of the misconceptions about Islam. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to uh, do what I call a goodwill agreement. I come here. Uh, to share my perspective with you, um, and I presume each of you has goodwill in being here. So you can ask any question without fear of me presuming that it is um, out of any ill will. So uh, I presume all questions are welcome, anything that comes to mind, please don't feel embarrassed to ask. Um, sometimes if something is on your mind, it's on other people's minds as well, um, and then maybe we can flush it out uh, to the best of my ability, and if I can't, you've got three better speakers coming soon that you can see. <laughs> All right, does that sound fair? Okay, yes. so we'll begin. Um, I would like to talk, I would like to talk about a couple of definitions. So there is the word Islam, and there's the word Muslims. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about each. The word Islam is an Arabic word, Semitic roots. They have three, uh, they have trilateral roots. It is a word uh, that, its root means salima, to, to be whole, to be at peace. Um, and Islam, literally, the, if, if you were to put in a dictionary the word Islam, in an Arabic dictionary, it would mean to surrender oneself over to, to resign oneself over, uh, obviously, to God is the religious connotation. But you could say uh, uh, in any context, linguistically, that it means to surrender oneself over to. But because of the root, it does entail some of these honor, other connotations of wholeness, of peace, of serenity. Um, and a Muslim... Uh, and again, this has to do with sort of Arabic morphology, is one who engages in that act of surrender. So Islam is the religion. Um, a Muslim is one who follows that religion. Uh, it's a little easier with something like Christian and Christianity. You just sort of put the IPY at the end. With Islam, it's a little trickier because of, because of, the, of, of the Semitic roots. Um, so a Muslim is one who surrenders himself over to God, thereby attaining peace and serenity in their lives. That is, that is sort of the, the, the connotation there. Now, a Muslim can be um, from any ethnicity, race, um, any walk of life. Um, what is the most populous Muslim country in the world? Can, can I have Indonesia. 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 Yeah, right? <laughs> Southeast Asia. Not what people will think of when they think of uh, Muslims, uh, if you just watch the news. Uh, Muslims can be from all walks of life. Some famous American Muslims that we all know, uh, we lost Muhammad Ali last year, iconic figure, uh, famous worldwide, um, and was very outspoken about his faith as well. Um, another one that, that people are always uh, talking about, uh, Cat Stevens became Yusuf Islam, attracted a lot of attention with leaving music 
to for a more spiritual pursuit. Um, so Muslims can be from, from all walks of life. The question then comes and says, what does Islam think of itself? How does Islam view itself in the bigger picture? In order to do that, I think it's important to understand how does Islam view all of humanity? So we believe that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created mankind. And he created mankind for a purpose. And he wanted that purpose to be communicated to them. And so he sent a series of messengers and prophets. Okay, so we believe that God created Adam and Eve, and after Adam and Eve, there was Noah, and there was Abraham, and there was Moses, and there was Jacob, and there was Isaiah, and all of these people that God sent in order to communicate how he wanted humans to live their lives. Uh, and so, in understanding Islam, it's important to understand how Islam sees itself in the rest of human history. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, has a famous tradition in which he says, he, you know, prophets like parables a lot, and he says, <laughs> Uh, I, 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 my, my coming to you is like a large and beautiful building where people are walking around and saying, isn't this such a beautiful structure? Isn't this such a beautiful building? Except there's one brick right there that's missing. And he says, I am that last brick. Uh, and so he taught his followers that he was completing the mission of Abraham and of Jesus and of Moses and of Noah and all of these other uh, prophets. Uh, not to replace or remove but to complete. Um, and that's very important to understand how Islam sees uh, prophethood. Now, Muslims also believe that we know of 25 prophets mentioned in our holy book, the Quran, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, but we also have a tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that says God sent over 124,000 prophets to humanity. And no, pro no community existed except that God sent to them his message. So in the Muslim belief, we wouldn't specify and say so-and-so was a prophet outside of the 25 that are identified, but we could entertain that the Native American peoples had prophets from God. We could entertain that the you know, Asians had uh, prophets from God, that all of these people, that no people were left without guidance from God. Now, prophets had one unified message with some variables. So in the Muslim belief, all messengers come with a basic creedal foundation, which is there's only one God. They all came with that message. Now, the specific teachings around that, how to live the life, whether or not you keep the Sabbath, etc., all of those things vary from community to community. So Muslims will often distinguish between the creed and law. <laughs> law varies from community to community, changes with time. Right? But the unifying foundation of all of this is the oneness and unity of God. So, for Muslims, there are some who theorize that maybe Buddha was a prophet, for example. Muslims would say that's possible, no one can confirm that, those are interesting theories, and there's many Muslim scholars who have written about this, but we wouldn't deny that possibility as well. And what this does, and I think it's, there, there's, there's the reason I'm sharing this, is it's important to be able to appreciate uh, truth within other traditions. And it's all too often to say, well, we follow the Prophet Muhammad, he's the last brick, and so we have the purest form, but you don't have to, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can dismiss all of the other truths out there in the world. I think anyone who studies great world religions, uh, like Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism, cannot deny that there are eternal truths buried therein um, that come from a divine source. So whether or not that comes from earlier prophets and those peoples, etc., um, is unknown. Uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about how Islam fits within the Abrahamic faith. So I kind of went through the world religions. If you narrow down into the Abrahamic faith, Islam sees itself as, again, the culmination of what was a gradually revealed revelation from Abraham. Um, as many of you probably know, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a descendant of the patriarch Abraham. He's through his... Uh, he's through Ishmael in that lineage. Um, and in fact, the city of Mecca, who here has heard of the city of Mecca? You know who the founder of the city of Mecca was? Abraham. So it was a barren valley, uh, and he went with, uh, with uh, Hagar and Ishmael in the barren valley, and they founded this, in the city, uh, and they, they found a well there. And that's actually mentioned in the Bible, the finding of the well, when uh, Ishmael, God heard the babe when he spoke, and the spring poured forth. It was called the Valley of Becca. 
in, in, in the Bible. Even in ancient Arabia, it was with a B initially. Uh, and the B and the M have a shared cognate in, in, in the Arabic language. Uh, and so it comes from that line. Um, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saw himself as the continuation of the legacy of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But I want to get into Islam. So what is Islam? Uh, Islam is a religion. It's an Abrahamic religion. And I think the best summary of the religion comes from a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, and this event happens probably within two to three months before he passes. And that's significant because Islamic scholars say that this is late in his mission and therefore a great summary of everything that he's ever taught. But the story says that one day the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was gathered with his companions. And there came a mysterious figure who, the description says, who was dressed in stark white clothing, and had jet black hair, and there was no dirt on his clothes, and he had no signs of travel. Now, what's so unique about that? There were, everybody knew everybody in that town. So if you were a stranger, you had to have come from, you traveled by horseback or by camel or whatever the mode of travel might have been, and you would not have clean white clothing by the time you arrived. And so they were surprised, who is this person, and why is it clear that he didn't just travel here? Where did he come from? And this mysterious figure sits next to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he asks him a series of questions. Okay? Now this series of questions, is going to be what I quiz you on at the end of the talk, <laughs> is, 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 is a great summary of Islam. This is what many scholars will call the three dimensions of Islam. Okay? Now if you know the three dimensions, then you know the spirit of what Islam does. If you leave out one of the dimensions, you have an imbalance, is, 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 is what ends up happening. So he asks him three questions. And he asks him, Oh, Muhammad, tell me, what is Islam? Now what's interesting is Islam is the name of the religion, but he clearly asks him in a very particular fashion about the dimension of Islam within the, the broader religion. And the Prophet Muhammad states five actions. Who here has heard of the five pillars of Islam? So that is, that is the answer to this question. So that's only one of three dimensions. We hear about the five pillars as if it's the great summary of the religion. But he says to him, Islam is that you testify that there is nothing worthy of worship other than God, and that Muhammad is his final messenger. Okay, so the first is a testimony. That is the way by which anyone becomes a believer in Islam. That is the way in which you enter into the faith is that you testify, there isn't a formal baptism, or, or other religions have a, a more formal process. This is simply to pronounce that while believing it in your heart. Okay? And then he says the second pillar of, of practice, uh, and that is to pray five times a day. So Muslims, based on the position of the sun, five times every day will offer a ritual prayer. Now this isn't a prayer like, oh God, please let me do great on this exam, or, let me get that job interview. Right? We pray like that as well. Uh, Muslims tend to use the word supplication for that, which is very specific, but a prayer which is simply uh, to worship God, to praise Him and to thank Him for everything He's given us in our lives at five points in the day. One is right when uh, dawn breaks, before sunrise. The second is that after the sun starts to descend from high noon. The third is in the afternoon. The third is just after sunset. And the fourth is when it's completely dark. And so based on the position of the sun, we stop, wash ourselves ritually, face the city of Mecca, and we perform the prayer. Um, for those who are curious, it probably takes seven minutes on average for prayer. Um, and whether you're at work or in school, you have to, you, you should make time and take a break um, and sort of reconnect and realign yourself. The third pillar of practice is uh, the fast. So there is a month of uh, in the lunar calendar, the Islamic calendar, the ninth lunar month is called Ramadan. Uh, and Muslims fast this if you are um, able, if you're not pregnant or nursing or elderly or sick or too weak, um, you fast from the break of dawn until sunset. Okay? Which means no food, drink, or relations, marital relations. Okay? You refrain from those three, abstinence from sunrise, so from dawn until sunset. So it's a lunar calendar, so it shifts. Winter, very easy to do. You're talking about 5 a.m. to almost 5 p.m. Summer, you're talking about probably a 4-ish a.m., if I remember correctly, 
until about nine. Okay, that's no water. That's that's a common question. But, but, but no, but no water. Yeah, no water as well. Um, now, if you notice, each of these answers is an action to be done. So Islam is the dimension of action, of practice. Okay, it is uh, right conduct. So some will summarize the uh, the the. Uh, the pillars within as pillars of practice. The fourth is to give what are what's called the four tax by some people, or the, the purifying alms. So every Muslim who's above the poverty line must give, and this is a must, it's, it's charity is, is what's beyond that, but everybody owes two and a half percent of their unused savings if they're above the poverty line. So this is not on everything one makes, but whatever is residual from what you use uh, of, uh, over the course of the year, for yourself, or your family, or your dependents, must be given to those that are in need. Okay, um, and this is uh, interestingly enough something that is deemed to be their right. That's their money that we are in possession of if we're above the poverty line. So we're not doing them a favor. You are withholding their right if you do not pay it out. Charity is to go beyond that and to give in addition, um, and, and and then it's an encouraged tax, but not necessarily mandatory. The fifth is to make a pilgrimage once in your life if you are financially and physically able to the holy city of Mecca. Founded again by Abraham, who here has seen a picture of the Kaaba, the sacred house. Okay, that was built by Abraham and Ishmael. Um, that, that foundation was laid by them, uh, and it has been rebuilt from floods and different damage, etc. But it stays in, it's, it's in the same location. Uh, so to go and visit the sites um, of, of Abraham and, 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 uh, and, and Hajjah, Hagar, um, is a requirement once uh, for for lifetime. So these are the pillars of practice. Then this mysterious speaker, remember this is a conversation, he says to the Prophet Muhammad, you have spoken correctly. And the narrator of the story says, and we were surprised, we were confused how he would ask him the question and then tell him he had spoken correctly. And then he asked him a second question. He said, oh Muhammad, tell me, what is Iman? What is faith? And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, instead of saying what faith was, he talked about the objects of faith. He said, faith is to believe in God, and to believe in his angels, to believe in his messengers, to believe in the scriptures that he sends, to believe in the day of judgment. Right? So these are all pillars of practice. No one has proper faith in our creed unless one believes in God. That's obviously, hopefully, uh, that's obvious. But then you must believe in all messengers. You cannot... Say, I believe in the Prophet Muhammad, but Noah, eh, I'm not sure about it, right? You must believe in all of the, all of the prophets. Um, uh, you have to believe in all of the scriptures. Now, we believe in, uh, we believe that there was the gospel sent to Jesus. We believe in the Torah sent to Moses. We believe in the Psalms of David. And we believe in what are called uh, the, the, the scripture of Abraham. Now, we will confirm the revelation of these, whether or not their remnants exist. So, for example, you know, the Sohaf of Ibrahim, what are called the, the scripture of Abraham, uh, there is there, there is nothing there that remains of it that we know. When it comes to the other scripture, and again, I'm, I'm being uh, uh, very clear about how Muslims understand this, Muslim belief holds that over time with history, uh, the authenticity and the accuracy of these decay. And then God sends another revelation. And the authenticity and accuracy decays over time, and God sends another clarification uh, through a, a separate revelation. With the revelation of the Qur'an, God states in the Qur'an, and we'll talk about the Qur'an more in a separate session, so I don't want to go too in-depth here, um, that it will be protected from, from decay and, and, and corruption. Um, and so this is declared as the final revelation uh, to, 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 to mankind. Uh, but we also believe in the Day of Judgment, that each of us will stand before our Creator uh, held accountable for the decisions we make in this world, uh, whether they were moral and good decisions or whether we chose to obey our lesser selves. Um, but we believe that nobody escapes that divine justice on that day. Um, so we obviously believe in a life after death, and that entails believing in divine reward and punishment. We do believe in heaven and hell. Um, we believe that uh, it is faith that earns, you know, you have the famous, is it, uh, is it uh, faith or works question? Um, the Muslim would say it's faith, we would say both, it's faith 
um, but it also requires works to then earn God's favor. So the sort of prerequisite would be faith, um, followed by uh, have, how have you lived your life. So we believe that a believing Muslim uh, could spend time in hell temporarily to purge them of their sins if they live a wretched life, or God could choose to forgive them uh, and enter them into paradise. Uh, but belief is what we, what we are all held accountable to do in our lifetimes, um, and then we try our best with the works thereafter. Uh, and the last, the sixth object of faith, is that we believe in what's called divine decree. And this is a Muslim belief that all things in the world, our meeting here today, um, was only the result of God's willing it into existence. That nothing happened outside of his control. Uh, that we have free will, yet we are limited in our free will by God's allowing things to happen. Um, and so uh, that is both a source of faith and it's a source of strength. That for uh, typically you'll see a Muslim who goes through a very grievous situation like the passing of a relative or the loss of wealth, something like that, and realize, there's a, another uh, famous statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that no one can bring you benefit or harm save God. And he says in this tradition that if all of mankind uh, and all of the jinn, we believe in a, in a, in a, in a separate dimension, uh, spirits, were to gather to bring you benefit that God did not write for you to obtain, <coughs> they could not bring you any benefit. And if all of humanity were to gather to harm you, and God did not allow for you to be harmed, uh, then they would not be able to harm you. Uh, we, uh, you have to pardon my, my you know, Abraham being thrown into the fire, that's a biblical story as well, in the fire. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to share a story. I, I, I'm not sure uh, if, if it's there. We believe that when Abraham um, first declared his monotheism to his people, uh, they, they fought him, and they were very uh, Yes. Um, and so in our tradition, uh, the, the king there, Nimrod, he said, let us uh, create a large fire. We're going to burn Abraham. Uh, we're going to burn him alive. And so they stoked a fire for days, and his people made almost a festival of it. Um, and they made a catapult to cast him into this fire. Um, and we have a tradition that when, Ad, when Abraham was cast into it, God said to the fire, be cool and peaceful for Abraham. So even fire cannot burn you. <coughs> unless God decrees it. So we believe in God's complete dominion over his, his creation. And again, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was met with a, you have spoken correctly. Okay, after the second question. Pardon, because he's defining these terms. Uh, Ihsan is a word in Arabic that literally means to make beautiful. But this is the third dimension of Islam. So the first were the pillars of practice. The second was faith. <coughs> And now the third has to do with character. Faith, character, and conduct are the three, uh, the three dimensions of Islam. And so he asked him, what is ihsan? What is, it to, uh, what is it to make oneself and soul beautiful? And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he answers not with the process or how to obtain it, but what that result looks like. And he says, it is to be in a state in which you worship God as if you can see him. But you know that even if you cannot see him, that he always sees you. So this is what the scholars will talk about as a state of constant awareness and connection to God in, in every moment. So the result of the spiritual purification is that you will enter a state in which you are always present with God. And God is always present in the heart. This takes two uh, main modes in the Islamic tradition. So there is the belief that we have, we are composite beings. We're not just a body, we're a soul. We're not just a soul, we have an ego as well. And part of the spiritual process is to learn how to suppress the ego. So we all would know that it's human nature to be angry, it's easy to be spiteful, jealous, to covet things, right? And so part of the path of spiritual purification is to remove these negative qualities from our heart. Okay, so the, the first wing of the spiritual process is to purge oneself of what we call the mortal, uh, the, the, the mortal defects of the soul. And the second is to adorn oneself with the positive qualities. So to be generous, to be forgiving, to be loving, to be merciful, to be altruistic. These are all things that we have to inculcate in ourselves. It often requires effort. Some are better at it than others naturally. 
Um, but that, that, that takes effort from us all. But when we engage in this process, the end result is that we can be in a state in which we see God in everything. We see God's hand in everything and we are aware uh, of, his, of his watching us. Any questions so far? We can hold the questions until the end. Unless there's a clarification. Yes? Yes. That, that's a good question. I'm going to repeat this question because I'm not sure that, that the mic is catching all that. So when we talk about David and Joseph and etc., I'm saying the names in English uh, are, are the names in, uh, different in Arabic. Yes, because they're Hebrew names to begin with. So uh, uh, Moses is Musa in Arabic, uh, and the Arabic is very close to Hebrew. They're they're, they're cousin languages. Um, and then Joseph is Yusuf. Uh, for example, Abraham is Ibrahim. So there are Arabic cognates of, of each of those. Uh, but with these three dimensions, sorry, one thing I, I kind of want to tie together is with these three dimensions, we have with faith, conduct, and character, uh, we have what we believe to be a total submission and surrender to God of mind, body, and soul. So with our mind, we have thoughts and beliefs and perceptions. If you believe the world is flat or you don't believe that there's a continent called Australia, right? You can have that belief that's an error of thought, and it's an inconsistency of what you believe with the reality of the world around you. So we believe that proper belief, so if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe there is a creator, right, then you have a faulty belief about the true nature of the world, the reality of the world. So faith is for the mind to have correct thoughts about the world. And we will have a day of accounting. Okay? Then we have the body, which are the actions. And Islam is, is founded on these five pillars, but it actually encompasses all of human action. So it's obviously things like do not lie, do not steal, do not cheat, etc. These are things we do physically in the world. So that's how we would surrender our bodies over to God. And then of our soul. There are times in which we smile and we do nice physical things to people, but inside we think very negative thoughts. Right? And so how do we surrender our soul and our very thought and our very being to God is through this third dimension of our sense. So it's a mind, body, and soul surrender um, to, 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 to God. And in the, uh, to contextualize it a little bit in terms of uh, what you all might be familiar with, there's Judaism in comparison to Christianity is a very legalistic tradition. Is that, would, would that be a fair thing to say? I don't mean that in, in a, in, as a slight. I don't mean that in a negative sense. In, in, in comparison, and Christianity is a great, rich, and spiritual tradition. Islam sees itself as the fusion of the rich legal tradition with the great spiritual tradition. And that you have uh, both the letter and the spirit of the law uh, combined. And that you must know the supremacy of the spirit over the letter, but that it is through both that, 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 the, that the law is, is enriched. Yes, I think we have a question there. Yeah, I, I have a question about the fourth pillar. You know, when yes. you talk about it's, it's mandatory to make a contribution of two and a half percent. Yes. Where does that go? I mean, I kind of get the impression that Islam, unlike Christianity, is, um, you know, and this is probably my ignorance, no, no. not quite as um, structured, structured, centralized, uh, maybe? As, yeah. as yeah. Christianity, you know, yeah. with uh, organizational structure, um, you know, clergy. Um, you know, Islam, of course, has temples and imams, but yeah. I'm just you know, kind of curious if um, you know, my, my two and a half percent, yes. do I give it to the temple? Do I give it to somebody Great you know, on the yeah. fortune on the street? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. So you have, uh, it's, it's, it's up to you. So you have a lot of uh, leeway and uh, who you can give it to. What the Quran limits is who's eligible. So you have to genuinely be poor. You can't give me your. We can't. Two rich people can't say, "Hey, I'll give you my two and a half percent." You give me your two and a half percent, right? You told the sign that I gave you, right? So you have to be eligible for it. And there's eight categories of people uh, who can be eligible for it. Um, tradition historically, um, you, you, while we don't have a centralized church in that way, uh, a centralized mosque authority, people would either give it on their own. Most people will give it to family members. Uh, where you have relatives, you know, maybe distant relatives and not immediate relatives, 
But it, it, we are encouraged to take care of those nearest to us first. So instead of sending money into the flood in such and such place on the other side of the, uh, of the world, which is good, you can't neglect your neighbor that you know is going through something that's more difficult. Um, so you have some leeway there. Uh, there was a centralized uh, system in the past where somebody, you know, there reached a time where people didn't know who to give it to, and so they would give it to sort of their, I shouldn't even compare it to, but the IRS is a centralized uh, a, a system in which the government is aware of what we do with our money. There used to be a centralized government thing where you could give it, and somebody could then come to the government and say, I'm in need, I don't have money, and they say, here we have this, this, this fund of money um, from, from the poor tax. Um, but it, that's not mandatory, that's not how you have to give it. Here, People will uh, just give it to people that they know are or are in need. Yes, we're going to get the mic back to you, and then I'm going to continue a bit more after this. I'm going to finish up, and we'll, we'll take time for questions at the end. Yes. Can you explain the practice or, or, or ritual of um, sort of blessing the name of Muhammad with? Thank you. Yeah. The way that you did. Yes. Because I noticed you did it every time. Recently. Yeah. I think there were a couple times in okay. the beginning when you were explaining the history where you did not. So yeah. is it every time? It, it is It is something. So for all of the prophet's names, sometimes what we'll do is, if it's a longer sentence, um, and it just becomes cumbersome with audiences that aren't used to it, but if I were to say, um, you know, Jesus, Moses, and Abraham, peace be upon them all, are all prophets. right? So if I'm going to use them in a sentence continuously, sometimes we'll do one honor of uh, one honorific at the end of that. Um, but it's something that we say for all prophets, um, that may, may God's peace be upon them. Um, the prophet Muhammad uh, has a, a, a special status as the seal of all prophets. Um, and so for us, it, it, there's, you know, we will say, you know, may peace be upon him pretty much every time. But sometimes what we'll do is, if I just said it two seconds ago and I'm kind of continuing, it tends to be something. So it's, it is something that we try to, to say at, at uh, for all prophets. Can I just yeah. Add on to that? Yeah. So for non-Muslims, yes. If the, is that something you would expect them to do if once aware, or is it something that's just required of? I, I, if, if, no, I wouldn't say that's something that we would expect. I think I, I think uh, there's a uh, there are you know people of other faiths. There's a Jewish professor out in Yale who I've noticed in all his lectures will say it. Um, as an honorific, uh, but if someone doesn't believe in him being a prophet, I don't think it would be considered disrespectful to not say that. I think it would be appreciated if somebody went, you know, honored that who other people honor, but by no means an expectation. No. One more question, and then I'm going to try to uh, chuck through the rest. Of the, uh, Ten Commandments. Yes, so we have the Ten Commandments. Uh, so the question was, do we have the equivalent of the Ten Commandments? Um, in a limited fashion, outline like that, uh, no. But the Ten Commandments are part of the Qur'an. You know, they're, they're present in the Qur'an, um, and they're all listed there. Um, there are other commandments that go beyond that, um, but they, again, what we would believe is that they are for the Muslims. So if you don't believe in Islam, you won't be held accountable for this. But the Ten Commandments, we believe, are Abrahamic. That everyone um, that is of an Abrahamic faith should be adhering to. So with your permission, I'm, I'm going to continue on, and then um, uh, I wanted to talk very briefly uh, about, and then we can open up for any questions that, that you might have. I want to open up very briefly on the misconceptions. So I know we have another speaker who's going to speak about the Quran, another one who's going to speak about the relationship between Islam and Christianity, um, but I'd like to speak a little bit about some of the misconceptions. Uh, unfortunately, we live in a time in which I think the misunderstandings about Islam have probably never been higher. Um, with as much access to information that we have, uh, it's a double-edged sword. So we can live in a time where we have access to accurate information, and so that should fix everything. Or we can have access to really inaccurate information, and that can confound everything. Uh, that all is compounded by the existence of small fraction groups that do really heinous and horrible things, and claim to be representing Islam. Uh, personally, and Muslims have different feelings about this, this is a really difficult topic for Muslims. Uh, it's a source of frustration, it's a source of uh, just, just uh, quite a lot of grief. I 
personally think that if I weren't Muslim, uh, and I probably live like most people, I think I would have a good deal of misunderstandings about Islam. Um, I would tip my hat to all of you for taking the time to really seek out and educate yourselves. Uh, but if I were exposed to what most people are exposed to, I probably would just say, what is going on there? Right? Um, but we live in a day and age in which it's, we are not as, we don't live in silos and islands anymore. We can go out and connect and meet people. Uh, one of the great tragedies is that, that, and I want this to be your theme, if I may, to understanding each of the misconceptions that we're going to bring up here. Um, there's, there's the great problem in all religion of using religion to inspire versus justify. Right? We, 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 we know that. So somebody can say, oh, but they say this and this and this in your scripture, right? We all know, especially if you have teenage children, right? Something can be used to justify just as much as it can be to inspire. And you can often come up with two radically different conclusions. If you read something and you say, okay, what does this want of me? What is the intention of this? Versus, I want to do this and can I use this scripture to justify? And I think if you simply use that lens, you can make a lot of sense. You can make much more sense out of a lot of this madness. Okay, That's one tool I, 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 I put in our toolbox. The second is to understand that there is no there's nothing called Islam in the world. There, there's no Islam devoid of human application and understanding of it. There's no pristine, you know, Plato has the forms, right? There's no Islam that just exists in a pristine place where we can go and see Islam in like this room. There are Muslims, and they're going to apply it as they would like. And we are very well aware that the intersection of religion and politics can lead to uh, a lot of uh, warping of religion for the sake of politics. So if you use the second lens of just looking at geopolitics sometimes, does this, does this just being a bunch of humans who have political problems, does that explain what's going on, or is this really the religion that, that teaches this? Um, and I think those two things will be very helpful. I'm not an expert in geopolitics. If you were to ask me about ISIS, I can talk about some of the um, like Islamic law aspects that they, that they contravene and contradict. But I couldn't tell you if it's the power vacuum that was left by taking Saddam and could we have done this. But you know, there's people who have written long, long books about this. These are complex issues, but they're clearly not solely a religious or legal issue. This, this, is, this is global geopolitics at, at play. But the first that I'd like to start with, and I'm going to ask everybody to help me out here. and Just let me know if this is something you've heard or maybe even think or believe yourself. Who's heard Islam was spread by the sword? Persian. Okay, Persian. That Islam was spread by the sword. Right? Heard it. Okay, I'd say about half of you have heard that. Um, that, is, that is something that I would say is still said quite often nowadays, and not just by you know, wacky people who have their agenda. Um, there are people who, are, who, who really hold this, this, this opinion. So, is, was Islam spread by the sword? It's a historical question. Uh, this, the, the, so I'll answer that shortly, but the, can Islam be spread by the sword is a separate question. So was it and can it, right? So for the was, the answer is no. You simply have to sort of look at history. Anybody who knows, um, uh, one of the easiest exercises to do is who's aware of what's happening with ISIS in Iraq and say Christian minorities, Zoroastrian minorities. You guys somewhat aware of hearing of these things, right? Okay. It's a really... It's one of those things that's so obvious we sometimes don't think about it. How are there Christian minorities still there? Right? For ISIS to now harm. Right? So you have Christian minorities in Syria, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Morocco. In, name the Muslim world, you can find non Muslim minorities. Now, we're talking about a 14th century history. If it was conversion by the sword, in medieval times, that was an acceptable practice, right? Spain, then you, you, you had the Inquisition, right? You had all of that happen. That was just what people did back then, right? You could get away. Might made right in that world. You didn't have the Geneva Convention in the UN, and, <laughs> right? That's just what happened. So these, these minorities existed. Who's heard of Maimonides, right? Maimonides, Jewish rabbi. Where does he learn and rise to prominence? In the Muslim world, right? In Muslim Spain, right? So 
Religious minorities were protected and even flourished under Muslim rule for over a millennium. Right? So the fact that they are now being harmed, we should be able to realize, well, the fact that they're there means it's not intrinsic to Islam. Something's happening now in which some wackos want to just fight everybody that doesn't agree with them. But the fact that they're there, there's, Mor there's Jews in Morocco, in Libya, in Algeria, in Iraq, in Yemen. They still have their communities and their synagogues, right? And, and, and let's, be, let's be very honest, religious liberty wasn't great in Europe for a period, right? So, I mean, this was, in those times, that, that, this was, that was an anomaly. That, wait, you're in power, and you're allowing a minority to kind of do their thing for a long time. You're allowing them to rise in the ranks of your government and become ministers, right? So, um, so Islam was not spread by the sword, nor can it be spread by the sword. Um, it's sort of a contradiction in terms. Surrender and faith are by their very nature voluntary. Um, but there's actually an explicit verse in the Quran which says there is no coercion in faith. You cannot coerce someone to have faith. Um, and actually there's a, there's a very interesting verse where God is trying to console the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's preaching to his people and like all prophets, they're fighting him and they're, not, and they're, and, 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 and they're casting him out and he's preaching to them and they're torturing his followers. And God says to him, do you think you can force these people to convert? You're so, he was so grieving over their wanting them to accept guidance. And God says, it's not in your hands. You convey. Your responsibility is to convey God's message. If they don't accept it, it's the, you can take the horse to the water, right? But you can't make them drink. You can't, don't lose sleep over this. You simply convey to the best of your ability. Um, but the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we hold was so full of mercy that he wanted their salvation um, so deeply that it, that it bothered him. Um, so that, that, that would be my response to was Islam spread by the sword, is that the proof is in the pudding. You have um, so many uh, uh, flourishing non-Muslim communities in Muslim lands. The second is, what is jihad? Right? You hear this word. Uh, it is a word that unfortunately has started to have negative connotations. For Muslims, it tends to have a positive connotation. Um, particularly more than like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it had a very positive connotation. Jihad means something like a noble struggle. And it could be used in any, con in any context. There's actually two types of jihad in, in Muslim tradition. There is what is called the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. The greater jihad, let's start with the lesser jihad. The lesser jihad is to defend oneself physically, militarily. Right, so we're being invaded, and you know, you can even think of this on a community level, right? We're being invaded, and some people pick up pitchforks and say we're going to defend our kids, and that, that's a type of jihad, that's a struggle. You are putting yourself on the line in order to help others, in order to serve others, in order to protect your land. One day the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was returning from a battle just like that, where people were coming to exterminate the Muslims, and on the way back, the Prophet Muhammad says, we are leaving from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And they said, these are, they're battle-weary, right? They're exhausted. They said, whoa, messenger of God, what, what is the greater jihad? I mean, we just, like, we almost died back there. It is, it, it is, the, it is the battle of your ego. It is the spiritual battle. And in fact, in Muslim tradition, it's, it's commonly said that one cannot engage in the lesser jihad unless it conquered their own ego. Right? Um, it, is, it is a prerequisite to use force that you are spiritually balanced. There's a great writer, Robert Bly, uh, that, that I enjoy reading. He talks about the difference between a warrior and a soldier. Right? Can, even, in, even in our terms, those, in our mind, those are different. If you think of a samurai warrior, that is a noble person who spends so much time in spiritual discipline in order to use his mastery of the sword to defend the weak. Whereas nowadays we have soldiers, this is not to take away from, who it can, you can just sign up and in a matter of weeks be put in front of the opportunity to take a life with no spiritual discipline, right? With no training, without anybody really guiding you and giving you that moral compass. It's simply a function. It's pulling a trigger, pressing a button, etc. Um, so is terrorism jihad? It's a good question. I, I do think it is. 
uh, one, there's a great British Muslim scholar, Timothy Winter, who, who, who coined this, and I think it's a very useful. Uh, he says, terrorism is to jihad what adultery is to marriage. So terrorism is to jihad what adultery is to marriage. Um, if one, I, I don't think that requires much commentary. I, I, I really don't. I mean, I think we can see about, yeah, certain acts might look the same, but they're done in very different ways with a very different spirit. Um, one is a really vile violation of one of the Ten Commandments, and one is a great, uh, a great union that can, that, that, that can be the foundation of a family. Um, so so uh, this is something that Muslims truly believe, is that jihad is a means um, to defend the weak, to defend religious liberty, actually. If you look, the, 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 there's a verse in the Quran which talks about um, the use of force. And God says, permission has been granted for those who have been expelled and kicked out of their homes. Because when the Muslims, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought his message, all of the Muslims were kicked out of their homes, oppressed, tortured, some of them were killed, um, and so they fled. And they were, they were expelled from their homes and they went to a, another city. And God says in the Quran, permission has been granted to those who have been expelled from their homes because they've been oppressed. And God can grant them victory. But I want to get to the rest of the verse. Those who were take, kill, kicked out of their homes without any right, other than they said, we believe in God. Our Lord is God, right? And then God talks, tells us the reason for defense, right? That violence is an inescapable part of human nature. So when is it appropriate and when is it inappropriate? And to what extent? It's all about the regulation. There's no, there, there isn't a, a, a country on earth without an army or a police force or somebody has to sanction what is a, a justified use of violence when the state engages in violence. It has to have its protocol. You have to know the, um, you know, to, to what extent, how much force was used, was it appropriate, etc. But God tells us the reason for defense. He says, had God not used one group to repel another, then churches, synagogues, monasteries and temples, and mosques. So not just mosques, right? Mosques, this is literally churches. And you can look it up in, in any <coughs> churches, synagogues, temples, and mosques would be destroyed, in which God's name is praised. So the primary reason the scholars say for defense is to our First Amendment, freedom of religion. That's, you know, our, you know, our country was founded by people seeking this, this um, so that is what jihad is at the essence, is protecting the weak uh, and, and, and the harmed. Um, one more, and then maybe we can open it up to questions. Are we doing okay on time? Yeah, okay. Uh, the last one is, and I don't feel right speaking about this, but it's just sort of a necessary evil, is women in Islam. Uh, we have, we're going to have a couple of women speakers. If you have questions, save them for, 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 for her when she comes. Uh, but just to share this, what, do, what does Islam hold about women? What are, what are, what are the Islamic beliefs about women? Um, one of the, uh, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm really trying to share not a like polished PR version of Islam. I'm trying to say what would be, if you walked into our mosque, what would we be talking about? Everything I've shared with you today is my attempt to genuinely convey how we understand our religion. So Islam sees people as human beings. Uh, who have diverse cultures and understandings, um, but all of us share an innate humanity that, that we cannot escape. Many of the things we see on TV that kind of freak us all out, Muslims and not Muslims, tends to be culture. Once you examine that a little more deeply, you have cultural expressions, and they some of those cultural trends existed before Islam reached those lands, and they just sort of stayed on there. Um, but in the end, Islam holds that we believe that the two genders are... Uh, signs of God. So there's a verse in the Quran that talks about that God's creating Adam and Eve. Think about it. The all-powerful could have created one gender that had like some type of asexual reproduction, right? And we could have all, right? I mean, think about it. It's possible, right? It's, it's conceivable. But God created Adam and Eve. And in that is a sign of God. In that is a sign of the deep beauty of the human experience. In the Muslim tradition, we hold that there are uh, qualities 
that are praiseworthy. Some of them are strength and courage, right? These are courage is, is, is one of the four moral virtues, right? Uh, strength and courage, men tend to sort of have a bit of that. Those are considered the easier ones to have and, 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 and acquire. Compassion, right? Forgiveness, mercy. These are the ones that really define God. If you open up any Quran, does anybody know what it opens with, the opening phrase of every chapter of the Quran? This, this will be a good one if someone knows this. What is every, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful? Right? Every chapter of the Quran, save one, starts with, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. These are the qualities that are most central to God. We, God is the just, right? Nobody wants to say, oh God, be just with me. Right? We say, oh God, forgive me. Oh, oh, oh God, pardon me. Right? We all want forgiveness for our shortcomings. And these are the qualities that are seen that would save humanity if we embody them. And they tend to be, again, there are exceptions, but they tend to be uh, more present in women than they are in men. There's a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he says that God said, and this is God speaking in the first person, and you have to know Arabic a little bit to fully appreciate this, but the word for womb, right, in Arabic is rahm, and the word for mercy is rahmah, and the word for God being the all-merciful is ar-Rahman. So God says, I have made my name ar-Rahman, the all-merciful, I have made the word for womb a cognate of my mercy. And so whoever cuts off kin, the ties of the womb, literally, from him they will be cut off from me. And so we are told that the womb, and if you think about this, the womb is really the, 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 uh, the seat of God's creative miracle on earth. Right? So we talk about God being the creator. It, that, that, that really takes place in, in the womb. So there's something very esteemed about that. So the woman has a very special rank in Islam. Um, there is obviously uh, in Islamic a personal code, a difference in how men and women are to, to, to cover. Uh, there is what is uh, considered an appropriate covering for women, which differs from men. Um, that, has, that shouldn't be understood in any way of a preference or a superiority or all of these words really loaded and charged words that people will put in, but, but a difference, that men and women are different. And I would argue that women's beauty far exceeds men, so that, that to me makes, makes sense. Uh, but that is, that is, a, that is Islam's um, recognition, I think, on one level of, uh, of protecting women from what can be uh, objectification. And I think if, if anybody here is even slightly familiar with the marketing industry and how much money is pumped into the objectification of women, we can see that people can do that if they don't have barriers in the way. Um, and that's, that's something that uh, has happened throughout human history and is still happening even as sort of enlightened as we are. Um, we go drive by billboards and like the grocery stand and it's, it's you know, it, 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 it's a degrading um, display, I think, at times of, of how we honor uh, women. There's a tradition uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that uh, heaven is under the feet of mothers. Um, and so the mother particularly, women in general, but the mother in particular has a, a heightened status um, in Islam. A man came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he said, after God and his messenger, who do I have to commit myself to the most? Who has the most right over me? And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, your mother. And the man said, okay, and then who after that? He said, your mother. And he said, okay, and who after that? He said, your mother. He said, who after that? He said, then your father. And this is a famous thing that all Muslim mothers throw out. <laughs> three times. It's three times as many hugs and kisses. You know, that whole like, nope, other mom first. Muslim men sort of throw out their hands. Yeah. Um, but, the, but, the, but that the mother is a very honored uh, uh, position. Um, and even Mary, in our tradition, obviously is revered as the most pious woman in Humanity, uh, who often is depicted as, as cover and pious and modest. These are things that don't mean much. Modesty isn't really a virtue people throw out and say, oh, what a modest thing to do or, or how modest that person is. But Mary really personified that. Um, and in fact, in certain, certain Muslim scholars actually debate whether or not Mary was a prophet. Um, but she's obviously the, the, the mother of Jesus, and that in and itself um, is, a, is a, an elevated rank. 
we do believe about Jesus, just to clarify a couple of things, and then we can open up for questions. We hold that Jesus was born of a virgin birth, um, so we, we, we share that with, with the Christian faith. We hold that he is the Messiah, um, whereas uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters differ with us on that. They're still waiting for the Messiah. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we believe that he is coming back at the end of time. We believe in an Antichrist. Um, I'll hold all my jokes to Antichrist jokes right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but we, we believe... We believe in an Antichrist. We actually believe in, a, in what we would call a culture of the Antichrist, which precedes the Antichrist. So you have some of his minions come out and really create uh, an environment in which truth is treated as falsehood and lies are considered as truth and inversion. Right? So that, that culture precedes the coming of the Antichrist. Um, but we believe that Jesus comes back at, at, at the end of days uh, as well. That, uh, where Muslims do differ from Christians is that we do not hold Jesus to be divine. Um, we believe Jesus to be a prophet. Yeah, I might have actually even used him as an example of a prophet. We hold him to be a, a prophet, um, a created being, and I know there's wide variability in Christian theology. Um, so I, I believe fully human and fully God is the Episcopalian position. Um, I think this would be closer to like an Aryan position that he was created, human, prophet, that he is... Uh, the Son of God in a metaphorical sense, but not God the Son in a literal sense, would be the Muslim position. Um, but that he was godly, most definitely. Um, and so uh, he is uh, someone greatly revered. I know many Muslims whose names are Isa, which is the Arabic for, for, for Jesus. Very revered. Many people will name their children uh, Isa. I know several of Isa. Um, but I hope that gives you sort of a brief overview of the fact that Islam has many cultures under it. Uh, there's complex theological uh, questions that, that one could spend much time on. I don't consider myself an expert in Islam, and it's not a statement of humility. Um, it's, sort of, it's sort of like, uh, I, I just, I, I, but I know true experts in Islam. And I, uh, but if you have any questions, I would, I'd be happy to share them uh, and discuss them. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, we have a mic coming around. So. Um, hello, my name is Charlotte. And my question has to do with how is the uh, Quran interpreted in such a way that there are people that are wanting to create a caliphate or an is, um, Islamic state? Very good question. Um, so the word caliph is not really in the Quran in the sense of an Islamic state or a caliphate. Um, so it's not really a Quranic problem. Uh, the Quran talks about general values and principles such as uh, ensuring justice, and ensuring order in society and safety for people. Um, how Muslims choose to do that is up to them. The caliphate was a system that worked. The caliphate really only existed for 30-something years. After that, it kind of morphed into a whole lot of things. You had dynasties, and you had emperors and sultans. and um, Those who, but I, I, this might be your question, is where do those who call for it get, get it from? Um, and it's a puritanical desire to go back to this pristine sort of let's recreate something that existed for a glimmer uh, of, of history. Um, there's there's, there, there's a, a funny story that, so the caliphate, there were, there were four um, caliphs after the, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. These are sort of like his four closest companions, disciples. And they, uh, they were political rulers after he passed. Um, there started, the turmoil started to, to happen in the midst of those four caliphs, there was, you know, people were being people, right? The empire started to expand, people, there were conflicts, there were battles for power. And one day, a man came to the fourth caliph, and he said, why in your reign is there so much turmoil? But in the reign of Abu Bakr and Umar, so the first and the second caliph, so caliph number four, why was it so great under caliph one and two, and we have so much turmoil? And in response to him, he said, well, because when they were caliphs, they had followers like me. But now that I'm caliph, I have followers like you. <laughs> so, pretty, pretty, pretty funny story. But there's, there's, that's a very romantic picture. We know that we don't have the disciples, the companions of the prophet. Who's going who's gonna to create such a pristine thing? So I think it's, um, there, it's sort of like, um, I, I, I really would, I would com com compare it to like, 
Leninism to some extent. Right? This idea that I can create a utopian vision, right? We can get it right, and even if we have to kill a whole lot of people to make it happen, it's a great idea in theory and we can make it work. Um, and they've just convinced themselves that a very strict understanding of how to assemble a Muslim government. Um, but there's no directive in Islam to assemble a caliphate. And the vast majority of Muslim scholars, like, they dropped that subject a long time ago. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I hope that's not. I think there was another question. Um, you had mentioned that one of the pillars of Islam relates to um, leading and following the prophets. Does that mean yes. just the identified prophets in the Quran, or does it also mean there's a requirement for potentially being open to following the other prophets that may have been sent down in yes. different places? Good, good, good question. Um, I would distinguish here between following and believing in. Um, so the belief is to affirm their prophethood. So for the 25 prophets, we simply have to affirm their prophethood. That I have to believe that Joseph was a prophet. I have to believe that Jacob was a prophet. Uh, I'm not committed to follow them, because not all of them have a religion with teachings that were really passed down to follow, but I have to believe in them. But it does also open up that door that you, we, as Muslims, part of Muslim belief is that the prophet Muhammad, so if you hold him to be a prophet, said that there were 124,000 prophets, you're open to prophethood having been all over the world. Um, and, and, and I think that you don't have to specifically say, I believe, they say so-and-so was a prophet, I have to believe in him. Um, that, that becomes optional at that point. The 25 that are named in the Quran, um, and there are a few actually, for those who are curious, there are a few that are in the Quran but not in the Bible. So you guys will be familiar with, I would say, probably 21 out of the 25. Um, but there are other prophets that were on the Arabian Peninsula that are not... Because Judaism and Christianity was for the tribes of Israel. And that was their prophet. But God sent prophets to all other types of people. We believe that the prophet Muhammad, and he says this explicitly, was sent to all people. He wasn't sent to just the Arabs or the, the Israelites, but I was sent to all of humanity. Um, one of the interesting things is the Jews were actually in the city of Medina, where the prophet Muhammad made migration to, um, awaiting the, the coming messenger, because they had and their scriptures that there was a, but they, they thought he was going to be Jewish. So when it was from the line of Ishmael, there was some resistance, and, and uh, they, they, they did not follow him by and large, with, with, with some exceptions. Yes, I think I saw your hand first. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you mentioned that my name is Ray. I'm thinking about anti-Islam sentiment and lack of understanding, and I'll just think about our country, it has seemed to me that there's been a dearth of voices, Islam, Islamic voices speaking out against ISIS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as I think about what that might look like, um, I guess I'm wondering what you think about that. You're here helping to change or educate one heart and mind at a time, and we in this congregation, maybe in the Bay Area, are open to that. But there's an awful lot of uh, headline-grabbing stuff going on that is completely unnuanced. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your sense is of what would need to happen in this corner of our world to counteract this misinformation, if you have an idea about that. Yes, yeah. That's a great question. Um, this is a question we hear quite often. And, 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 and it's, a, it's, it's one of those things that I've given quite a lot of thought to. Um, so interestingly enough, in the Bay Area, sort of what I think is one of the best hidden secrets of the Bay Area, the most influential Muslim scholar in the Western Hemisphere uh, teaches in Berkeley. Uh, and so we have some of the biggest powerhouses of Islam. I mean, if he goes to the Muslim world, I mean, it's, it's thousands of people packing a hall just to see him. Um, one of the great tragedies is we have to, and, and I, I'm just putting it out there, it's not a critique, I'm not making any other political commentary, uh, is the media. He always jokes, he says, you know, if I wanted to call the jihad against America and death to the state in America, he said, I'd be, on, I'd be on CNN tonight and I'd sell, you know, a million books and I'd be a millionaire and I'd be done. And he said, you know, if any of us really have financial problems, just say you hate Islam and you love Islam and it's the worst religion in the world and write a book about it and you'll, 
you'll, you'll, it'll be a bestseller. There isn't, there isn't a whole lot of interest in that. Muslim, if you simply Google, how, how many people here, I, I'm just out, just out of curiosity, have Googled Muslims condemning ISIS? Do that. I encourage you. Just because that's, the, the, the perception is, have Muslims condemned ISIS? You will see pages. Add not, Muslims are saying, if you go into a mosque, they say, can we stop condemning ISIS? It's all we do all day long. <laughs> can we just stop it already? They think everybody in the world has heard us a thousand times. Like, enough of this already, right? Um, Muslim scholars, leaders cannot get the type of platform that would make that effective. Now, here comes my commentary. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be objective. That serves someone's agenda. I have to, I have to believe it. There is an agenda when, you're, when you need an other and you have military conquests in certain places, etc. Uh, sure, right? There are also ratings to keep in mind, right? If I was part of a plot to undermine, you know, this church and I got caught, I, yeah, that's much nicer than saying, well, you know, the, 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 this church held a great talk and there was a good conversation. This won't make the news, right? But if I wanted to bring harm to you all, that would make the news. So that's, that's sort of what we're stuck with. There's, an intro, there's a website called Letter... Uh, Baghdadi is the last name of the head of ISIS. So if you go to letter to Baghdadi.com, uh, it's a letter signed by 300 and something of the top Muslim scholars in the world from all schools, Shiite, Sunni, everything in between, all condemning and, and, and arguing with, with, with Baghdadi, um, telling him that he has opposed the absolute um, foundation of Islam with, with, with his way. Unfortunately, it just, I, I don't know what the, it's a source of frustration for Muslims. Um, and, and I think uh, we're making progress just in these small settings because I know for sure we won't make it in larger mainstream media. Um, because, and, and the reason that I know that is because we've had people who we would deem our brightest and best and, and they've been totally shut out of the media. You know, and, and it's not like the media doesn't know them. They've done pieces on them. And they, but when it comes, they, they would rather have a really controversial figure than somebody who really represents um, Muslims up there, unfortunately. Yeah. I uh, know that the divisions between uh, sects is certainly not uh, particular to Islam. These Christians have certainly fought each other and hated each other. But I just wondered if you could shed a little light on the, the Sunni Shiite division. Sure. That's a, that's a good question. The Sunni Shiite division is, uh, I'll just frame it this way, uh, wasn't a problem before, you know, 20 years ago. Um, Shiites and Sunnis are different sects of Islam, and they do have a type of competitive nature between one another, right, as, as do all sects of religions, um, but there has never been a violent history prior to the late 20th century uh, between them. Um, there were empires that were primarily Shiite that overtook areas. They had political sort of dimensions. But generally speaking, uh, Iraq is a, is, is a great example, as is Syria, of people who will tell you, oh, you know, if you speak to somebody, any, anyone over the age of 60, when we were children, we didn't know, we'd go, you know, we didn't know this neighbor was Shiite, this neighbor was Christian, this neighbor was Druze. Nobody knew who anyone else, what anyone else was, and it didn't matter. Um, similarly, and this is slightly more politically infused. Similarly, Jews and Muslims in Palestine, right, will tell you that, yeah, this whole thing, you know, how many of you have heard, oh, they've been fighting each other for hundreds of years? No, they weren't, not before 1947, right? Oh, 49. So we, we've, we've got to look at things with a geopolitical lens a bit. Um, there traditionally is no, no, no real history of violence between Sunnis and Shiites, and particularly in those regions. Uh, I think once you destabilize and you create um, the nation-state model where each people have to now fend for their uh, individual rights and it becomes a zero-sum game, then you're going to have everybody sort of... And that can happen anywhere. You know, if you have, um, in this country, rights riots break out in certain areas, you have people sort of hunker down into their groups because of conflict. But that didn't pre-exist that conflict coming. So. Yes. Theologically, uh, very good question. Theologically, the primary, 
The primary division is over what is the best way to, 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 to lead the community after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad had grandchildren through his daughter, so his, his, his lineage, um, and his cousin married his daughter, and so heard in the Sunni tradition, uh, but the Shiites said they are the most qualified to be our political leader. Um, and they pretty much put them in a position of like, yeah, yeah maybe Pope-like might be, might be a word, but that they, this bloodline is uh, protected by God, they don't make errors, um, and, and they are pure. In the Sunni tradition, they said they are honored and they are, are spiritual, they have spiritual mastery, uh, but they, they don't have political um, and so that's, that's really where that division happened. Um, and that division came when the fourth caliph, the one that I talked about, the son-in-law, he was a son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And during his reign, there was a lot of strife. Those, some supported him, others supported another side, and then they just sort of broke off. And what was initially a political difference turned into a theological one. So who has more right? Sunnis would like to frame it as, we believe that the best man should lead. Um, ah, that's kind of a spin. It really is simply just a question of uh, does does the Prophet Muhammad's family have a special status politically or or is it spiritually? Um, for us, it's it's, it's it's a spiritual leadership. Yeah. One more question. Absolutely. My name is Lila. Um, I like to read about our history as Christians and the various sects that have come over the years, over the millennia. And um, I was reading a book called Oh God But God yes. by the same author of The Zealot. I recommend it, but I'm wondering if you have another, other books that you would recommend for understanding. Yes. Um, it's almost as if I planted you in the audience. <laughs> I, I get that question often, and today, for some reason, I remembered. I called my, my oldest son, hey, go grab this book and that book, and then he was like, what do you need all these books for? Uh, because people always ask, um, and I think it is important. Okay, okay. Um, so the first one is written by Karen Armstrong. She's, if you're familiar with her, uh, on, on the Prophet Muhammad, called uh, Muhammad, a Prophet for Our Time. Um, it's a good summary of his life and his mission and message sort of melded in together, um, and I think that you all would like it. Thank you so much. This is a new book that just came out, and I really like it, actually. Um, it's called A Thinking Person's Guide to Islam. Um, and the author, uh, he's a Jordanian prince. He's sort of like the Prince Charles of, of, you know, just somebody who spends all his time just like reading and thinking, very erudite. Um, but he's of, of the Jordanian uh, monarchy. Uh, but he's a religious scholar, um, and he wrote this book called The Thinking Person's Guide to Islam. He chooses 12 verses of the Quran in, in 12 chapters that he thinks summarizes um, the, the, the message of Islam. And he does a lot of debunking of misunderstandings as well um, in, in that way. He says that the crisis for both sets of people who misunderstand Islam, both what he calls the radical jihadists or the people of Islamophobes, I guess, is, is a more common term being used right now, um, is a lack of thinking about Islam. Um, and he says that if you were to think about these verses and look at the big picture instead of cherry pick, you'd What's make the author's name? Um, Prince Ghazi, G-H-A-Z-I, and his last name is Muhammad. Bin Muhammad. This is one of my, this is, uh, so I have two copies of this. One is my really worn life. <laughs> right? And I was telling myself, no, no, we have another one that's like newer looking. Uh, this is a book that never gets old. Like you finish it and you go right back to the beginning. It's written by Hamza Yusuf, who is that scholar local here to the Bay Area that I told you about. Um, this is a book on uh, the third dimension of Ihsan, of, of, of making the soul beautiful. Um, and this is a great summary of the, of the Islamic spiritual tradition. Um, just briefly, it talks about how to rid oneself of being a miser, having hatred, love of the world, envy, fear of poverty, ostentation, relying on other than God, etc. So all of the spiritual diseases. Uh, sorry, purification of the heart. And the author's name is Hamza, H-A-M, as in Michael Z-A, and Y-U-S-U-F. 
Do you think I can email you this? Do you guys have like a, yeah, they told you that, so, yeah. And this, um, and I thought of an interesting coincidence on the way over here, but uh, this is called, the, it's the Creed of Imam al tahawi Don't worry about that, that, that last name. This is one of the earliest um, creedal works of Islamic history that all Muslims agree on. So if you had like, what do Muslims believe? This is, this is a, great, uh, a great book. And I was thinking about it on the way here, Dr. Rowan Williams, who's a uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, um, wrote one of the uh, blurbs on the back, so I thought that was kind of a neat coincidence coming over. Yes. Um, and this is probably, yeah, this is just my favorite thing to come out in the last year. It's called The Study of Quran by Harper One Press, um, and it is a tome of just a wealth of information. So any verse in the Quran, you can go to it um, and look up but what it meant according to classical commentary and the broader Muslim tradition. This took a team of several scholars, I think about four, five, sorry, five scholars, ten years to produce. Um, and it's an unbelievable, I mean, it's a mind-blowing work. And there are several essays in the back for those who really want to get into um, several essays on the back that are more thematic. So what does the Quran say about you know, various subjects in the back? The Quran in depth, the Quran in ethics. Uh, the Quran in the afterlife, etc. Um, great summary. For those who are sort of more academically inclined and really want to read for hours and hours, this, this, like the, the problem with this, once you open it, you just kind of keep going and going, oh my God, there's more than you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I think, we're, uh, I think we're out of time, so uh, let's uh, give one more round of applause. Thank you. Sunday, a more significant Sunday for some people, but it's Sunday, and I know you're here to worship, and it's spending extra time here to learn about another religion, um, really shows uh, a type of intellectual empathy um, that, that, that is very important to have uh, nowadays. So uh, the Muslim community is feeling pretty, um, these are interesting times for us, and so these gestures really do mean a lot. So on behalf of all Muslims, trust me, we, we really appreciate people. Oh, thank you. Thank you.